Okay, uh, thanks very much for asking me to speak uh, in this uh, really interesting series. Uh, I don't do biology as such. I, you know, I work on non-equilibrium stat mech and active matter, which is motivated by biology. I hope that's all right. The other uh, rule breaking I've done is that my two part talk, tutorial and uh, research seminar, are on two rather two different topics. It's a little bit like giving an to use a Hindustani music analogy, like an alap in one raga and a khayal in another. So you'll have to tolerate that, okay? Uh, anyway, so I'll first, I'll start with the tutorial uh, and I'll you know, introduce the subject and I'll remind you guys as, uh, as your students about linear response at thermal equilibrium, uh, namely the fluctuation dissipation theorem. And then I'll tell you about uh, what happens to it in a class of non-equilibrium systems called active matter, and then I'll summarize. Okay, so I mean, our interest, I mean, my interest, a lot of my research interest has been in understanding active particles and act collection, collective behavior active particles as a problem in statistical mechanics. And the idea of such particles is that each particle is powered, each particle is supplied with energy and has some machinery to turn this energy into movement. And collections of these kinds of particles are called active matter. And we are relatively unambitious so far in the active matter trade Information processing is barely beginning to come into the motion of these particles. Anything beyond that, you can forget. It's really about the mechanics and statistics of uh, not very clever active particles. And, uh, you know, what we'd like to do eventually is to understand a system uh, like this, or even a completely different kind of system, a 2D quantum system, maybe that you're energizing in the third direction. Both of these, in principle, are active matter. I won't talk about either of these today. Uh, as you know, active systems are open. They're in a state of sustained energy throughput, and therefore, you know, they are dissipatively non-time reversal invariant. And uh, we'd like to understand their statistical mechanics. But I want to begin with the equilibrium fluctuation dissipation theorem. And the reason is partly that there was a talk, a few talks ago in this series, where the speaker said that even though they know they shouldn't really be doing it, they're taking a, a living tissue system and using uh, fluctuation dissipation relation in the form of passive microbiology to extract its viscoelastic properties. Now, in principle, that's not okay. I am absolutely sure the experimentalist concerned had good reasons for doing it in that particular case. But because of that, I thought I'd first tell you how we understand the relation between correlation and response or fluctuations and dissipation in thermal equilibrium. So first equilibrium. Supposing you have a system governed by Hamiltonian, uh, H0, and supposing you take that system and perturb it by a time-dependent field F, which couples to some phase space function Y. Um, let me uh, emphasize at the outset that I'll talk only about a classical dynamical description here. Uh, but you can certainly extend this to quantum systems and see what you get yourself. Uh, if the phase space distribution function is rho uh, of gamma and t, uh, then you can ask, if I put on this, this field coupling to y, what is its effect on either the same or some other phase space function x? Okay, the average of that function x at time t will be given by, its, by taking its expression in terms of phase space coordinates and weighting it with the non-equilibrium uh, phase space distribution function that happens to prevail in the system as a result of this perturbation. F, I should have said, is time dependent. Uh, and if you want to, what we are interested in is the response relation between X and F at in the limit of F going to zero. That object is obtained by differentiating the average of X with respect to F uh, and taking F going to zero. And that object is called the linear response function. And it contains this, it can be re-expressed in this fashion, that the deviation in X average from its equilibrium value is given by a linear operation on the driving force with a kernel, which is the response function. And obviously uh, it's, you know, it goes minus infinity T because uh, there's no response before uh, the disturbance, okay? And um, you can work out this function by looking at the time evolution of uh, these averages using the Liouville theorem on the distribution function. So in phase space, no matter what you do, as long as uh, 
you respect the laws of classical mechanics, uh, Liouville's theorem holds, you can break up the time evolution of rho into a piece from H0 and a piece from F. This object, uh, sorry, this is, I've written this badly here. I have missed out the del rho over del t. This pair of objects pertains only to this bit. Apologies for that. Okay. Anyway, you take this, and uh, what you really, all you really need to do is to consider perturbations f, which are instantaneous. F is a delta function because if you do that, then uh, the response will directly give you chi x y of t, right from this thing. So we'll work that out. So what we'll do is we work out, we basically have to evaluate this bit. And there are various places where the expressions I write down are correct only to first order in F, which is okay because that's the only part we're interested in. So I haven't always made that clear. <clears throat> uh, also, I'm using a notation in which these square brackets are not commutators, they are Poisson brackets. Okay, so Poisson bracket of Y with rho, uh, using a result for a general phase space coordinate, see, on the, on the equilibrium distribution function, because rho equilibrium depends only on the Hamiltonian, uh, d rho over dc is just minus beta rho equilibrium times dc of h, where uh, beta is the inverse temperature. As a result, you can write this Poisson bracket in this form. You can plug this object into uh, the evolution equation for rho and rewrite it in this form because f is a delta function force. And you can therefore relate this object to the unperturbed evolution of the variable y. As a result, you find that the uh, expect the average of x of t is that which is after all going to be given by the evolution of x of t just based on an initial condition just after the perturbation rho equals t rho at t equals zero plus, which you can evaluate from here by just integrating forward, and the delta function will give you a little contribution here. So you find that average x of t ends up being this guy, this guy in turn by integrating this equation using f being a delta function, ends up giving you just this little contribution. Integral over phase space, rho equilibrium times one plus w beta y dot in the absence of perturbation times x of t gamma, where x of t gamma, as I said, is the time evolved to x at time t, uh, which you can rewrite as the equilibrium average of x plus w, which is the strength of the perturbation, inverse temperature times the correlator of x and y dot. Okay, so just to reiterate that, average x of t can be re-expressed as average x equilibrium plus w b average x of t y dot zero. So you see that the perturbation x of t minus x equilibrium ends up being just w beta times the correlator of x and y dot. This object isn't, so this is the fundamental result of linear response theory. Take an external field, couple it to some phase space variable, or some phase space function, y, and then ask for the effect of that perturbation on some other phase space function, x. And the result is that that response function, the linear response function, can be related to a property of the system in the absence of the perturbation. The correlation function, which I've written as x y dot here, the correlation function of x and y dot in the absence of the perturbation. So the power of linear response theory and eventually the perturbation dissipation relation is that it tells you uh, dynamic response properties of the system when you perturb it in terms of properties of the system when you don't perturb it. Okay, but let's spend a few more minutes um, turning this into a more familiar form. You can use a whole bunch of properties of correlation functions. Oops. A missing here. C A B of T is supposed to be the average of A of T B of zero, which I can rewrite as the average of B of zero A of T, which I can shift. I use time translation variance to write it as B of minus T A of zero, which then becomes C B A of minus T. Okay, I can use that. I can use the fact that the rate of change of C A B, which I can write this way, can be rewritten through elementary manipulations as the correlator of a dot and b, a dot of t, b of zero. I can take that result and use these, these past two results 
successively to manipulate the object I started with, namely C X Y dot, into the form that I would like. Namely, I can re-express it as a rate of change of C A B T. And therefore, for the particular case of two variables X and Y, the correlation function, the response function of X due to a perturbation on Y, displaced in time by time T, is minus the inverse temperature times the rate of change of the equilibrium uh, time dependent correlation function of x and y with time separation t. Okay, this is the familiar time domain form of the fluctuation dissipation relation. Okay, so chi xy of t is minus beta d over dt cxy. Notice that beta came in purely through the fact that when you differentiate the equilibrium distribution function with respect to any phase space coordinate, the result has the inverse temperature times equilibrium distribution function again. It doesn't matter what ensemble you're working in, derivative of log of, uh, you know, derivative of uh, the log of the distribution with respect to the energy is the inverse temperature that's true in micro or macro. Okay, so what we see therefore is uh, that the response function time displaced is minus beta times the correlation function for time greater than zero, and of course zero for times less than zero. A further set of elementary uh, mathematical manipulations, uh, writing these guys in terms of their Fourier transforms, can will show you, and it's a nice exercise for students to do, especially to find the nicest and easiest way to do this. Chi double prime of omega is beta omega over two times c omega. This is often the practical form in which the relation in the classical system is used. You know that in the quantum system, it's not beta omega; it's one minus e to the minus beta h bar omega over h bar, but you can work those things out. This relation is useful because if you imagine what you're looking at is some extension coordinate of some viscoelastic system, you can measure the spontaneous fluctuations of that coordinate, which is viscoelastic dynamics. And from it, you can figure out the viscoelastic modulus. You can figure out the imaginary part, but Kramers and Kronig will tell you how to get the real part. So you can figure out the complete viscoelastic response if you know the correlation function uh, at all frequencies. Remember to use Kronos and Kronig, you need, you need to integrate over all frequencies, so you need to assemble the weight of these correlators over all frequencies. In any case, the point is, it's not just a theorem, it's a great tool for systems at thermal equilibrium. Okay? Uh, I assume nobody has any questions at this stage because everybody has done this in graduate school, but feel free to interrupt me if uh, you do have a question. All right. Um, so that's fluctuation dissipation at equilibrium. Uh, let's now move uh, to active systems. How am I doing for time? Um, Shriram, you have about 10 minutes. Okay, all right. Uh, 12 minutes to be precise. Okay. That's not too bad. So now, uh, active systems can be viewed in the following way. Now, these are collections of particles, each of which has the ability to consume a chemical and to uh, degrade it and use some of the energy and let x be a variable measuring how much chemistry has happened. x is the number of fuel molecules consumed. And uh, as a result of that uh, fuel consumption, because of a chemomechanical coupling, an active particle moves or executes some kind of systematic work. That we call moving in a spatial direction. So basically, if you want to understand active matter, you just take this object and imagine you have some grooves drawn on some uh, terrain and you tilt the terrain in the chemical direction. That's so you drive the chemical coordinate in one direction. Uh, and the result is because the mobility of this terrain has a non-diagonal bit, you don't just move in the chemical direction, but also in the physical direction. Okay. And the typical driving force we talk about is that we maintain a chemical potential difference between reactant and product and uh, you end up moving spatially. So we worried about this in uh, some detail uh, in the context of writing down Lajoie equations for active systems. Uh, and there's a long and partly pedagogical and partly new research paper by my student, Lokar Shri, and my former student now at Paris, Ananya Moitro, uh, on which some of what I'm going to say hereafter is uh, based. It's very much in the spirit of the analysis of molecular motor systems that uh, uh, Ilusha Azari wrote it uh, several years ago. Okay, so let's see, how do we construct, using this description, how, description, how do we construct equations of motion for active matter? What we do is we imagine you've got a system 
with uh, some physical coordinates and some other coordinate, which could be chemistry or could be not. And imagine writing down a comprehensive equilibrium type Lajoie equation for the system, which contains, uh, it, formally you can even introduce a momentum conjugate for this chemical coordinate and write down a full dynamics. This is the force, this guy will eventually become delta mu. Imagine that the dynamics of the system has off diagonal uh, kinetic coefficients coupling uh, the uh, uh, so the damping on each of these variables is determined not only by its velocity, but the other velocity. Okay, let's throw away the inertia of that chemical coordinate and write a reduced set of equations. Let's eliminate the rate of change of the chemical coordinate by in favor of the driving force on the chemical coordinate by taking the chemistry equation and solving for x dot in favor of dxh and uh, the velocity of the physical coordinate you then get a set of equations. So that means here, instead of x dot, I replace it by this guy, this guy, and the noise. Yeah, I have a uh, clarification. Yes, yes. Yeah. Lubra is asking, how can you define uppercase pi, big pi? Uh, so yeah. do, first of all, even for a chemical coordinate, it's actually the rate at which some effective chemical coordinate is progressing. Uh, but I could instead start directly at this in this form. I don't really need to do that. But in any case, even the chemical reaction involves, you know, it could be an isomerization, it could be something moving. So they'll end up being a variable that actually has to move. So there will, in general, be some momentum like variable. As, but you can imagine doing this for any, you know, you can do a reduced description starting with any variable. Okay. And so then you get, um, at the moment, this is still equilibrium. Well, I, I haven't yet held the driving force constant. This is the couple dynamics of QP and X. Um, and, uh, you know, it's equal in dynamics. The, the transformed noises will satisfy the correct relations with the transformed dampings. Everything will work very, very nicely. Uh, and the, now if you want to turn this into an active system problem, all you do is hold this guy constant. So it means you've taken the chemical terrain and held it at a fixed angle. So there may be little bumps in it which I'm not resolving, which have to do with the kinetic value of the reactions. But the effective equations of motion for Q and P, if the off-diagonal kinetic coefficient had a dependence on the coordinates of the system, is a dynamics which now has a new term. So there's a term proportional to the chemical driving times, in principle, a new kind of dependence on the coordinates, which can't be derived from an energy function or can't be derived from you can't be invoked in the original problem without a delta mu. So this dynamics, and you have the chemical dynamics on the side if you want it, this dynamics is active matter dynamics. Okay, that's, that's all, that demystifies active matter. Okay, and let's skip ahead to a particular case. Supposing you have, so let me apply this to one particular case. Suppose you have a dimeric particle, a blue head and a red head, which are different in some way. And let X be the central mass coordinate, and let little x be the relative coordinate of these guys, which is a kind of orientation coordinate of this, this thing if you're moving in more than, one, more than uh, one dimension. So then you can write down dynamics, and you can say that in general, if I describe the process I just mentioned, the momentum equation will have a term which depends on delta mu times a relative coordinate. If you hold that relative coordinate, this delta mu fixed, the relative coordinate forces the momentum equation, the central mass momentum. So if you have a dimer, in a situation in which you are executing a sustained chemical reaction in one direction, the polar extension of the dimer propels it. Okay, so this is sort of a silly cartoon of self propulsion in this active matter language. And you can take it and you can calculate entropy production in this system. One thing to note is this system, if you didn't have a noise on the center of mass coordinate, if you just wrote down these equations without this noise, the only noise was the noise on the relative coordinate. And if the internal, if the relative coordinate was bound in a harmonic, in a quadratic potential, the effective dynamics of this timer uh, can be written down in a form in which you have, um, if the dimer, if the particle is sitting in an external harmonic potential, it actually looks like an equilibrium system with inertia. That inertia has nothing to do with the mass. It ultimately comes from self-propelling character. 
So you can, in some limits, turn this problem into an equilibrium-like problem. Uh, but let me skip ahead. Let's talk about entropy production. So let's go back to this general class of problems, this pair of equations, and ask for entropy production. Entropy production is defined by the ratio of probabilities of forward and reverse trajectories, which ultimately comes from the ratio of probabilities of realizations of the driving bike noise with forward and a time reversed version of that. So uh, it's a log of this ratio, which is divided by t and infinite time limit, which is called the entropy production rate. You can calculate it by writing down a dynamic action uh, for this pair of set of stochastic differential equations, which will look uh, like this. I've uh, here gone to the limit where I've thrown away uh, inertia for the central mass coordinate as well. I have a totally inertia less description. I have a functional, on the other macro functional for the general problem, depending on whether h is harmonic or not, it's easy or more complicated to deal with. And you can then calculate the entropy production rates. The other point I want to make here is you can imagine asking for the probabilities of the forward and reverse processes with while treating the extension coordinate of this dimer as a coordinate-like variable or deliberately choosing to flip it. So you can ask for forward reverse ratios with or without polarity flip. And the reason is that the case with polarity flip is what corresponds to this uh, effective inertia description. You do that, you can express the entropy production rates in terms of correlators of central mass velocity and coordinate or driving force and coordinate, depending on whether you do or don't flip polarity. And for the case where all the potentials are quadratic, you can calculate these guys. You can then further, and this brings me back to the theme I started with, you can ask, okay, what I want to know is, on what time scales are the important contributions to entropy production coming? To do that, you take recourse to Harada and Sasa's very nice result, which shows that the entropy production can be written as an integral with just a you know, minor weight involving frequency of the difference between these two quantities. These two quantities would be identical if the system was thermal equilibrium, and the entropy production rate is actually given by an integral omega, omega times this difference. So you can call this of the integrand here, the frequency resolved entropy production rate. And that guy uh, for my pet dimer is appreciable only at intermediate frequencies. At very high and very low frequencies, it goes to zero. You can do something similar for the polarity flip case. We won't worry about it. So the um, interpretation, Sriram, yes, yes. Uh, this is your three minute morning. <laughs> that is great because I'm almost at the end of this part of the talk. Okay. I don't know if you understood anything, but I'm making my time. So. <laughs> What you, uh, why, why do you get the entropy production only at intermediate times? The point is that if you, fill, if you do a very, very coarse filtering of the dynamics, then the fact that the, dime, the driving, uh, you know, the, the, the orientation of the dimer was driving the system, uh, you don't resolve the time correlations of that. The, time, the, the colored noise which entered the position equation as a result of the, the uh, dynamics, the driving dynamics of the dimer, effectively looks like a white noise. That's why on very low frequencies, you don't see it. At very high frequencies, basically, if you start the system out and let it run, then you haven't sampled for long enough to see the true active steady state. So again, you get this. So this is really interesting. This is what this says. Basically, is that for a problem like this, if you do it, if you filter only looking at very low frequencies, you can get an effective FD relation. Uh, but that will really only tell you about the dynamics of the, the very slowest so that's really all I wanted to say. I don't have a concluding slide. What I have is slides from experiments on looking at, that, at uh, Nitin's uh, experiments that, that, uh, that um, uh, Kim mentioned, where he looks, looked at the uh, large deviation function of these of one single set of particle in the lead medium. That's fun physics says is just to tell you that these kinds of ideas are accessible to element experiments and even very, very simple experiments like vibrating granular matter. So that's all I wanted to say. I'll be happy to take questions on this part of the talk. All right. Thanks, uh, thanks, Ram, for a really nice talk. So I will start by reading some of the questions that are already in the chat box. And uh, you know, to the audience, please feel free to ask more questions. So I will start with this question by uh, Rudra Biswas. And he asks, uh, if I follow correctly, does this imply that we can 
uh, we can formulate deviation from equilibrium as some kind of generic deviation from Hamilton's equations. I would say generic, generic deviation. Well, okay. In principle, after all, if I take a, 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 I take the whole system uh, and describe its dynamics microeconomically, it is Hamiltonian dynamics. What I have done is introduce damping and noise as well. So I would say it's generic, homogeneously distributed deviation from equilibrium Norsma equations. Whether you choose to include momentum and a Hamiltonian description or an inertia-less description is a purely technical detail. But Sriram, he, Rudra had yeah. a rejoinder. He said that yes. uh, in, instead of equilibrium, he meant non-active. But Yeah, no, that's fine. Non-active. So, yes, uh, that's all active matter really is, yeah. where you energize all the particles in essentially the same way and they carry out energy conversion and move around. So active particles. An active system is just a system in which you suspended energy conservation, but you keep replenishing the energy that the particles uh, use up uh, by, by more. You keep your tank full. That's all it is. All right. Thank you, Shriram. Then there is a question from Raphael, and he asks, uh, he says, thanks for an interesting tutorial. What are the limitations of using the Langevin equation uh, used in your derivations for describing active matter? Um, several, I guess. One is that, in effect, in all these treatments, uh, you build the equations of motion uh, in a flux and force linear relation. So you could certainly worry about that. Second is, if you have a very general active system, like a vibrated layer of particles where it's mechanical agitation, you know, so there you don't even know what the bath is. This treatment is reasonably well posed for systems in which the bath is thermal and you're supplying energy uh, uh, from the outside to an intrinsically thermal system. Uh, in all likelihood, in living systems, you're operating well outside the regime of uh, linear universal thermodynamics. It doesn't seem to affect anything very gravely in the sense that it's rather rare that you get, I, I, have no, I know of no examples offhand where a term that was ruled out, that, that uh, was ruled out by linear irreversible, you know, let's say an active term in the equations wasn't detected already in the level of uh, linear irreversible thermodynamics. All right, so I actually have a question. So uh, in terms of the fluctuation spectrum of these active systems, I was wondering if, let's say, you knew the chemical potential in different active systems, can you say based on that, that if we have this type of chemical potential, then we will have this type of fluctuation spectrum? Like, can we say something about the okay, so the point is, if you keep, again, it's, it's a chemical potential difference between reactants and products. Right, right. I meant the and that, Yeah, and yeah. that is a driving parameter. Certainly, in principle, changing that parameter, treating that driving as a control parameter, can take you from one phase to another. Mm -hmm. So if you find if you find a stationary state of the system, then if you look at what, what spatial symmetries are broken, you can use fairly general pres prescriptions to figure out the long wavelength dynamics of the systems. And as long as the noise, as long as you don't invoke very strange noises, you can figure out the spectrum. But merely stating that you have a given value of the driving doesn't immediately tell you the, the spectrum of the spectrum fluctuations, it's still kind of the same thing as we do in equilibrium systems. If you know what kind of symmetries are broken, right. what kind of conservation laws are present, then you can work out on general grounds the fluctuations. Mm -hmm. All right. And then there is a question from Kinjal, and he's uh, asking, or he's saying, so ideally an experimental experimentalist should use the Harada-Sasa relation when doing rheology in an active matter system. So he's asking that. Are there ways to measure entropy production? Um, so um, you can, if you know the force on a coordinate and you know how the coordinate is moving, you can certainly measure the power dissipated. You, you, can, you can measure parts of the entropy production in, in these systems, certainly. Uh, whether you have access to all the degrees of freedom whose entropy is being produced is another matter, right? Because it's always going to be undetected degrees of freedom, but you can you can certainly measure parts of this. For instance, you can measure 
yeah, so you can, you can measure quantities of that sort. You can certainly measure entropy production if you know uh, that. If, or in some cases, you could measure perhaps by direct calorimetry or something like that. Again, if you have access to all the energy that's being dissipated. All right, and then there is a last question we will take for this tutorial for now. And that was uh, from uh, Manasa. And uh, the question is, how does this change bulk forcing versus active matter where forces are local? Sorry, I don't understand exactly. If the question is, what is the difference between a system in which the energy is delivered directly to the particles and a system in which you've got a box of stuff and you shake the box. So then, yes, so yes. I'm sorry, the, it was wrong. Okay, that's it great. I like got, that means minutes. I understood exactly that. Okay, great. So the problem with systems where you shake the box and the particles in the interior get the energy indirectly is that uh, it's there's no simple way of writing down the dynamics other than by introducing uh, a source at the boundaries and then monitoring the dynamics of that delivered energy. It could be interesting to look at that kind of case, as we have not done that. The kind of simple-minded modeling that we wrote down here won't work. You will need to introduce an explicit uh, forcing variable, which depends on location. You need to understand the dynamics of energy delivery from boundary to interior. You could imagine this being a lot of interest in problems where the energy is not necessarily delivered by shaking, but you know, let us say by oxygen, okay? Uh, and those kinds of problems, you know, I think there are interesting analogs to inelastic collapse, uh, namely death, actually, which you could look at in the systems. So we haven't thought very much about it, but I think that's an interesting direction to look at. All right, okay, I will ask one final question before we move on to your other talk. So Robin uh, Brunsma is asking, is there a variational principle for active particles? Um, there's a variation principle only to the extent, so uh, let me put it this way. There is a prescription for deriving the equations of motion as uh, I showed uh, just now, but I don't know that there is a, a Fringy-like object that tells you in general what stationary states are preferred. There is some progress in the context of, so if you mean, if by variation principle you want to know an object that's minimized, versus something that gives you the equations of motion. I don't know which of the two you want to know. Yes. Which one? I asked. There was an uh, or. The first. <laughs> the yeah, first. Yeah. So in, for example, uh, in just you know, scalar active matter, certainly people are beginning to understand uh, uh, what quantity is equalized between coexisting phases with various caveats on all of this. Okay. So yeah, in those contexts, uh, Julian Thayer, Mike Gates, many people uh, have been discussing. Or let me rephrase it. Could you formulate it as a path integral description for... So that you can, right? Because I just showed you the Langevin equations whose path yeah. of... But I must be... The framework yeah. is absolutely available. Okay. Thank you.